grateful to have you. Um, Pastor Mark, can you move? Can you move that for me? The banner. There? Move it over. There. Move it right there. Yes. Um, this morning we're going to be a little bit quick because we have a lot to do. We're going to have a meeting after we have dinner. So I promise myself I'll be done in 45 minutes. So we'll see. Okay. So we can because we have a long day. Um, just a quick reminder for you. Um, that's it, really. If you don't receive our um, announcements, please, you can call the church office and request one. Or you can email at welcome at calvaryagc.org. I know some of you don't receive the announcements. And also, we do have a gift for you. It's called Right Now Media. It's a, it's a database of movies, of um, Bible teachings that you can watch online. If you send us your email, we can add you to the list and send the email back to you. So you, it's our gift to you. Uh, you don't have to pay anything. You can just pray for us. But it's to help you build up your um, knowledge about the Bible and the Word of God. Amen. Also remember Friday night at 7 p.m. We are um, here. I'm always praying, seeking the face of God. Uh, you don't have to feel like you have to come and yell and scream. You can just be part of it. It's part of be building the community of God. Um, um, I continue to stress out that especially nowadays, it's very, very important for us to build our community because there are so many lonely people out there. You may not believe me. So many people committing suicide because of social media, and everybody's supposed to, supposed to be happy, but it's all just on the screen. All right? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you, God, for this morning. I, I ask you for your wisdom, Lord God, to speak, uh, preach your word. Uh, allow it, O oh God, to touch hearts, and we can come to understand what your will is and purpose for our lives. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I call my sermon this morning, uh, Let It Flow with a Vision. Last Sunday, the sermon was Let It Flow. It was about uh, the story of Moses when um, he, was, he was born during a time, this is in Exodus chapter 2, he was born during a time where they were persecuting babies. And an order was given for all the uh, boys to be thrown in the river. So Moses' parents took care of him for three months until they couldn't any longer. So what they did was they took a, a ba basket, they fixed it, they put the baby in the basket, and they put the baby on the river to let it flow, what we call by divine providence, or in other words, in the hands of God. And I point out to you, to you is this. We can try so many things in life, but sometimes comes a point when, when you tried everything that you, that you can, you have to give it in the hands of God. So Moses' parents put a baby in the basket, okay, and let it flow on the river. So I'm going to read with you. I'm going to skip to you where, what happened next. Um, so when they, when they put the baby on the river... Moses' sister, which called, her name is Miriam, stood at the side to watch what was going to happen with the basket on the river. And then if you go in your Bible in verse 5, in chapter 2, if you're reading along with me, it says, Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent for a maid to get her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Okay, The baby's mother, she called. Take this baby and nurse it for me. The princess told the baby's mother, I will pay you for your help. So the woman, the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, the mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lift him out of the water. 
To give you a better picture about what was going on, we have to just take a look back. Hundreds of years ago, God called a man, Abraham, to leave his family, and God said to him, I'm going to take you to a place, okay, and, I, and I'm going to bless you with a promise. God was going to take you to an unknown place. But also God said to him, for 400 years, your descendants will be, will be slaves in Egypt. And, but later on, I will punish that nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. Now, this story, this promise, was known among God's people. Moses' parents knew this story. So when they found themselves in the time of oppression, they had hope, okay? They had hope that something uh, would, would happen. And we see that what, the, what was intended for destruction increased hope. They know somehow God was going to work out something for them. So, Moses' parents decided to trust God instead of caving into the, the king's direction or instruction. Trusting God man, take the baby, fix the basket, put it in the basket, and let it flow. I am, I'm a guy. I don't know how it feels to put a baby in the basket and let it flow. I'm a guy. I don't know how it means to nurse a, a baby for, for such a long time, and then you have to release the baby. It doesn't say Moses' mom and dad must have been brokenhearted. But do you know something? They let it flow. Because in, uh, 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 the, the, the story, the reason why they let it flow is because their background, I put this here, to, like, the, the, the backdrop they had was a promise. There was a promise hidden in the heart of the people that God will do something. Specifically, they may not, be, may not have known. But they decided to just hope for deliverance. And you need to understand that sometimes what you hope for will not come in your lifetime. Okay? So what, what's hope? Hope is trustful expectation that God will fulfill his promises, either here or in the future. It is the anticipation of a favorable outcome under God's guidance. More especially, hope is the confidence that what God has done for us in the past guarantees our participation in what God will do in the future. If you look in your Bible, God did many, many things in the past. It guarantees us that he will do something in the future. It may not be specifically the way you expect it, but there is a guarantee that God will do something. So Moses' parents had what I would call my first point is an active hope. They didn't just say, oh, let's throw the baby in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the basket. No. They took the time. They prepared the basket. They, they diligently they, they, they spent time with it. And then they came with, they came with a plan. We're going to put the baby in the basket. And your sister is going to stand and look what was going to happen. Do you understand me? Because sometimes we want God to do something, but we cross our hands. We don't want to do anything else. Because I believe in God. It's true. They believed in God, but they were actively involved in the, in, 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 in the process. So, um, somehow, it's the understanding of scholars and, and people that study the Bible. Somehow, Moses' mom and dad knew the princess would go there to bathe. Okay? So, they didn't just go put it anywhere in the Mohawk River. No. They came specifically close to Calvary Assembly of God. Because perhaps somebody in church, when they leave church, will go and find the baby. And that's what they did. But here we see active hope. When the parents put that baby in, on the river, do you believe they thought that when the, 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 the princess was asking for a, a Hebrew woman to nourish the baby, that her daughter would say, I know somebody. And here's the trick. She goes and she gets her own mom. She gets Moses' mother to come and take care of the baby. Do you know, freedom comes after you release what you're hanging on dearly to. 
The challenge is that we are hanging on with so many things and we are unwilling to trust God that God does miracles. Her heart was broken, but she released her son, but she was able to feed him, take care of him, sing songs to him, tell him, tell him um, the stories of her own people until when he was older. This is how God works. And then we find, lifted up by hope, we find the, the, the princess. Her, her name, according to some scholars, was Termutis. When she sees the baby, she falls in love with him. Mo, baby's Moses was too beautiful to be destroyed. He was too beautiful to be killed. When God has something with you, when God has something for you, nobody can do anything to you. And this was baby Moses. She was supposed to say, oh, this is the kids that my dad is trying to kill. No. She saved him. When you let things flow in the hands of God, all things will work, work out for good for his purpose. Remember this, for his purpose. Because oftentimes we are caught up, it's my purpose. No, it's for his purpose. Now, how, were, how was um, Moses' parents able to let this child go? Because of their confidence. And I'm, I'm trying to give you a picture that this is like a backdrop. A backdrop, okay? So when they put the baby here, they will remember, we're going to put the baby here, but God gave us a promise. God, we're going to cry. It hurts to let him go. But we're looking back. You told Abraham, one day, one day, one day, one day, you will deliver our people. God, we don't know exactly what to do. We don't know exactly what is going to work, work out. But they, they had a hope. And uh, they had a hope with a vision. You see, because the promise was given to their ancestor was kept alive. Hundreds of years ago, God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. Do you know that today, and today you and I are enjoying that blessing? Do you know that through Abraham all nations are blessed? That we came to know Christ as our Savior? So it isn't just a promise from 100 years ago. It's a promise that you and I are enjoying today in this moment. They learned this lesson from their ancestor because God was known among them. Okay? God was known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God said to Moses, and I hope you know this story, when God told Moses, go tell my people that I want to set them free, Moses said to them, God, but what am I going to say to them? Kind of like, God, they don't know you, okay? God says to them, to Moses, this is what you shall say to the children of Israel. The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. God works through generations. Those people knew their story. They knew what happened before. They knew that God had a plan for his people. They knew that God offered them a, 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 a land where, with a, that flow with milk and honey. So they knew their story. Moses' parents understood the promise and continued to, um, that the promise continued beyond their time. Are you with me? You see, what do we do today? We believe only now. We have become so consumed by things that they told you to come to church only to get what you want to. That's not a reason church exists. Because Moses' parents, it's true, they, they were able to save Moses, but in the back of my, their mind, they say, I'm going to release this baby, the God of Abraham, 
Isaac and Jacob. They never met Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they knew that God gave them a promise. And they knew that God was faithful. And God says, for 400 years, your people will be oppressed. But then I will come and I deliver them. And if you know the story, exactly at 430 years, those people left that place of oppression because it was God's promise. God works through generations. How do we know that? It says in, in Proverbs 22, 6, for parents to trade, raise their children up in the ways of the Lord, and they will never depart from it. You have to raise your kids with a vision. Okay? You have to, to, to look ahead because faith flows from generation to generation. I'm going to give you an example. Um, 2 Timothy 1 through 5 says, Paul says to Timothy, I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Louis and your mother Eunice, and I know that the same faith continues strong in you. Our challenge today, church, is again, we don't let things flow from generation to generation. We're struggling. We are lacking a, a, a backdrop of hope, of trusting, uh, and, and uh, dependency um, upon God. What's, do you know what God's plan is since the beginning? God's plan isn't to make you rich. God's plan isn't to make you happy. God's plan isn't to give you all the bells and whistles. Because this life is temporary. All what you see, and we see it all the time, but we somehow, we see what tornado does, hurricane does, but we rebuild again. But that's not God's um, destination for our lives. All that, all what happened, everybody knows the movie Ten Commandments. All that happened with the Ten Commandments was pointing to us. It's hard to believe this, was pointing to us. Through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, one day Jesus, the Son of God, would come into this earth and die on the cross to save us. So we need to have as a, as a backdrop that Christ died for sinners. Christ is the Savior. Christ is the one that died for you and love you. And God's desire is for us to partner with him, just like Moses' and parents did. We see throughout the Bible that God's plan was to save humankind from sin. We were singing this morning, or we were thinking about all the pain that we go through this life. Do you know why we go through this pain? Because of sin, rebellion. This life will never satisfy you. There's always something. There's always sickness and diseases um, uh, um, due to sin. But Jesus has given you us a backdrop. You see, you can look, you, look and you, you can look ahead. Why? He became man just like you. And do you know what he did? He died on the cross. Now, I know for some people, this is crazy. Okay? The Bible says that one day I will be transformed. I will be changed. I will receive a different body. I will receive a new body. And, the, and, and I will die no more. And Jesus died on the cross to conquer all that. So in the meantime, there is a bunch of people all over the world that needs to know this Christ and Savior that many of you says you have welcomed him into your life. God's plan of salvation, he, desire it, he desires to continue it through you that profess to know it. Jesus is not going to come from heaven and walk around here to heal people. But rather, Jesus, by the, this Holy Spirit, has come and lived within our hearts. And he desires for us to put our lives at his disposition so he can use us for his glory. This is the idea about church, for you and I to become so invested in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are being lying to us. So many people are looking for superstars. The best preacher, the great preacher, the bigger preacher, the bigger church. That's all what they're after. But God is looking for somebody just.
just like you. There's fire with inside. And understand what the cross means. Do you know, I know what forgiveness is. Not because someone told me. Because I experienced it. I was a sinner. Crying, confused, depressed, and oppressed. And by God's mercy and grace, I met Jesus. And he, uh, by the way, he continues to change my life. Continues. It's an ongoing process. And when I met him, I said to myself, I have a good news. I, I have to share this news. But this not, doesn't count only for Pastor Siegfried. Some people tell me weird stuff about me that I really don't know. Jesus Christ lives in here. And lives in you. Amen. And I'm going to say this to you. Okay? Without doubt. Almost every single day, God stirs up something in you to share the gospel. Amen. What you do is you shut it down. That's what happens. It's not that God doesn't speak. Church doesn't need to be empty. So many people don't have to sit with their arm crossed. But rather, they should be grateful. And I say all the time, the reason why I do what I do is out of gratitude of what God has done for me. This is the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's the reason. It isn't because I feel special. matter, but sometimes I feel compelled. So what am I trying to say to you? God's plan of salvation should be the backdrop of our lives. Jesus died for you under sin. He's coming back. This is what should motivate you. I'm going to say to you this. Do you know something? I, 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 I know we talk about this. I believe this more in my heart now that I'm getting older. I shouldn't tell you that you have to pray. Amen. I should not have to tell you that you have to seek the face of God. I can pray for you to become aware of it, but you need to feel the, ur the urgency to respond. The Holy Spirit is speaking all the time, and we pick and choose what we do. We eat, we're hungry, we eat every single day. God is the Father, and He desires relationship with you. He desires connection with you. I told you this before, I can watch my grandkids for a long time. The minute their father comes in, they're, they're gone. Because I'm the grandpa, I'm not the dad, and I cannot give them what they're looking in, in the Father. And the same thing with us. And I know this because through the Holy Spirit, God is the one that brings up desire in you to pray. How many times when he brings it, you walk away? How many times when he does it, you feel embarrassed? How many times when you pray, you have so many excuses why you should do not? The problem is we are too much in control of our own lives. We are too much in control of our own time. If Christ really has died and resurrected in our lives, it's the time for us to do like, Mary, uh, like his parents did, let it flow. I know life is complicated. I know it's difficult because I'm, I'm not any different than you. I know that. But when you come, when you can go up, come up to the point where you can let it flow with hope, trusting in the hand of God, you will see that miracles will happen. God not only has called you to save you, God has called you for you to partner with him. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.9, God will do, do this, for he's faithful to do what he says, and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ. What's a partner? It's like two people that agree to do business together. Okay. So God is inviting you to partner with him. Christ died on the cross. You open your heart. He desires for you to share the gospel. You are the good news. You are. If you are truly, truly know God, you are the good news, not me. You are the good news. And God loves us so much that he shows us constantly what's wrong with our lives so we can fix it and he can continue to use us. You are not here for me to condemn you. 
You are not here for me to say thanks to you to press you down. You're here, you listen to this word so you can know who resides in you so you can rise up and do the work. And if you messed up, go to God asking for forgiveness and he will forgive you and he will use you for his glory. He will use you because he's looking for people to partner with him. And God has allowed you to know Christ so you can partner with him in preaching the gospel. I'm going to go back. Many people lack vision. They only look so far. God works through generation. It says in Psalm 119, 90, your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth. Your faithfulness. God was faithful before I was born. Hmm? God was faithful I don't know, in 200 AD, God was faithful in 1514. God was faithful in 1897. God is faithful today in 2024. And why do I know this? Because the track record. And God is faithful from generation to generation. Oh, my friends, some of you don't understand the mission that God has placed in your hands for you to carry from generations to generations. You see, we have so many stops, stops in, our, in our lives. We cannot think beyond ourselves. An example, this church was established in, in the 70s. Somebody was praying. Somebody received an idea. Someone received a vision. And they struggle and they pray. And, and I think in 1970, 1973, they organized the church. But do you know that person that prayed for the church? I don't know how many years it is right right now. now. So many years ago, never knew me, never knew you. But they had a vision. If I can start a church, hundreds and hundreds of people will come. Some of you think this ends with your life. If you can open your heart and realize the preaching of the gospel doesn't end with your life. It's from generations to generation. And that's why we have to open our hearts and let go of stuff and believe that even when I'm gone, still the preaching continues. And you have the power. You have the ability. I'm going to go back. The gospel that we are being told to accumulate things. We have become hoarders. More, 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 more. And forgive me sometimes, even when we pray, we want more, but why, what do you do with it? What do you do when God calls you when you cannot sleep in the middle of the night? You roll over and then you keep sleeping. What, God, what, God, what do you do when God puts upon your heart to go see somebody and you don't go? What happens when you go to, let's say, a grocery store, you see a person that's, that's not comfortable in your eyes, and you feel like you have to go do it, but you judge them and you walk away. And then you say, God doesn't want to use me. No, you are rebellious. You don't want to obey. I want you to know the people that you're seeking to reach will not come the way you have in your mind. They will not come that way. And they will come at moments that you're busy. They will come. They will be the annoying people. They will be the weird people. They will be the crazy people. But if you have the time to stop and think, then you realize Jesus came for the broken. He came from the weary. It's my time to partner with God. It's my time to partner with God. That's what I have to do. Do you know by nature we know this? By nature we know this. It's very hard to let things go and trust God. We hang, on, we hang on tightly on these things, which the things we hang on to and are a sign of ignorance and distrust. If you read your Bible 50 years and still you cannot figure out that God has a plan, You have to do something. One day, either you or I will be here. This work will continue. 
They may not even know who I was. It will continue. And the same thing with you. Same thing with you. Stop putting pastors on a pedestal as an excuse for you to do what you should do. Stop living and look at them as the one that has to bring everything and you don't do anything about it. Some of you, God has called you to pray for pastors and you don't do it. Some of you, God has called you to help and you don't do it because it doesn't look the way you think it should look. The closer you get to God, I hope I make sense to you, the less and less you will understand. God works with generations. God works with us individually, and God works as a body. See, Moses' parents, they thought about the nation. They thought about the promise that God has given the people. The people. And that promise helped them. We has a promise as a community. We has a promise as a church because the Bible calls us the body of Christ, meaning we are all related. Ouch. We are all related. We are all related. Same blood. Same reconciliation. Same forgiveness. And you, you ask me, why such a rift? We all were going through the same. We all said, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. And God embraced. Not only does God wants to work with you individually, but he desires to work with the body because he always did. And if you read in your Bible, after Jesus went to heaven and, and the, the apostles were together praying, the church came to life. Men and women came together. They prayed together. They served the weak because they wanted to be part of God's plan. Get out of the plan of the world and join the plan of God. Leave the excuses behind. Stop wrestling with condemnation. Open your mind and receive, receive forgiveness. Stop being so stubborn and so selfish about your rights. Because in Christ, we don't have, have no rights at all. Take your cross. We talk about taking the cross. Do you know why you take your cross? It's a sign of submission to the people that condemn you. A sign of su submission. Take the challenges that come your way and let God lead you and guide you. Even today, even right now, God is still looking. You may think I'm crazy. That's okay. Approved. Uh, God is looking for men and women that are willing to dig deeper, are willing to go closer, are willing to make the sacrifices necessary for them to preach the gospel. Do you know something? The people, many of the people that God calls to preach the gospel, what they have is courage. It's not education, but their heart is in love with God. And when they see people out there dying with of Christ. It breaks their heart. They cry out to God. God, there's something they must be doing. And they feel compelled. I have to go. I have to do something. Yes, Not too long ago, I was thinking about a group of people. They don't know Jesus. And they live in darkness. And I was praying, I said, God, this breaks my heart. Doesn't mean they won't go to heaven. So I spent some time praying and crying in myself because I don't understand. I don't understand this. So I, I'm compelled by, by his love and mercy to, to, to pray, to cry out. And you should be compelled to. It's good for us to come together and clap hands and praise the Lord. It's good, but it's better for you to go be to Jesus. Do you know?
know the closer you get, you, the closer you get to God, to God, the lonelier it gets. Just for you to know that. You think once you get closer to God, it expands, and it becomes very, very lonely. Because God wants you for himself. He doesn't like to share you with any other sin. He wants you. We need to backdrop um, church with a vision. Let it flow with a vision. And you, I, if you pay attention the last couple of since the beginning of the year, we designed this banner that says about one deal. It's one, we are one body, one baptism, one God, one love, one spirit, one hope. The idea behind this is to stimulate you to think about oneness what we can do as one. Because we live in a, play, in a time where it's very, very divisive. Do you know it's easy? Do you know, let me just give you a, a little bit of background. Do you know, um, some, many times I'm aware of 75% of the problems that we have at church. But maybe 25, I don't know, because sometimes there are things, what, what was the word? Um, I forget the word now. Some things that people don't see. You, you don't see them yourself. I don't see my own mistakes. What do you call those? Yes, you're blind to your own mistakes. So most of the time, I know what's wrong. I see what's wrong. It's, it, it, it bothers me. Okay? It's the kingdom of God. It bothers me. And I hope some things bother you too. And to realize what God has called us to do, to be one. I know, I know this isn't easy to be one. I know this. Because you know exactly what irks you. Hmm? But it's one thing. Can, can you grow beyond you? Hmm? Can, can you grow beyond you? As long as your eye is focused on people and you're judging them, that's what you're going to see. We pray. What do we pray in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us. As we forgive, so many people are cursing themselves. So many people are cursing themselves. Because as long as you dig a, a, a pit for your person and you bury it, the same way you'll be treated by God. So don't come and tell me, Pastor Siegfried, I need deliverance. You don't need deliverance, you need repentance. Think what you say. God hasn't called us to judge people. Christ judged them already. He wants us to partner with him, to humble ourselves, come off the high horse. Let's focus, church, to have the one deal as our backdrop. Let's go home, start revis revisiting our vision, why I'm here. Why, what am I doing at church? And start thinking, what has God called you to do? God gave the church a great commission. It's to go and preach. And it doesn't say the pastor. Okay? And that's why, because um, the one deal or oneness is always under threat. The Apostle Paul said, make every effort Ephesians 4, 3 and 2, 6. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit. Make every effort, try the best you can to stay united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body, one church. There is one body. There is one group of people. There is one here and then one, one general all over the earth. There is one body, one body and one spirit. Just as you have been, we have been called for one glorious hope for the future. We have one hope. Our hope is not any different. It's the same hope. Jesus Christ is coming back. In the meantime, we have to work. We have to labor. We have to preach the word of God. Because there is one Lord, one faith, the same way you believe, I believe, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. God is living through all. We have to come back. We have to revisit why do we come to church. 
why we're doing what we're doing, and we have to listen. We have to listen. What is God saying to you? Even right now. What is God saying to you about the information you're receiving? I know for sure. Step it up. Like I said before, cut a crap. Cut a crap. Start living crappy all the time. Be serious. Be decisive. Be willing. I'm telling you, do you know, do you know what's so hard? To walk away from, from temptation. Imagine. Imagine you have a big cookie like this. It's a gourmet cookie. It's creamy. It's delicious. It's so smelly. It's better than the one that you'd group made. And then you know you should not eat that cookie. And it's decorated, decorated on a table. So you say, no, you walk away. I'm telling you, even when you walk away, you'll be drooling, thinking about that cookie. You will cry because you want a piece of that cookie. That's what temptation is. But when you continue to walk, 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 you'll realize that you can live without that cookie. When you trust God and when you are intentional to do what he has called us to do. The backdrop. Moses' parents were able to defy the order of a king and still didn't bow down and save their child. We have today a backdrop, the one deal. One body, one hope, one spirit, one baptism. For what purpose? To extend the plan of God from generations to generations. And I believe in that. And that's how I see. I sometimes I know I talk a lot about myself, about my family. When I raised my son, I said it before. I told him since he was five, you are a leader. Because I was thinking beyond me. I may not see what my grandkids, grandkids will end up being. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Okay? It's just for me to fulfill my, my, my work now, to do it. So let's come and start thinking about Calvary Assembly of God from generation through generations. One day, Pastor Siegfried will disappear. There will be another person. One day, you will disappear. But the pews will be here. The building will be here. Let's go from generation to generation in the name of Jesus. Let's bind and rebuke powers and principalities of darkness. Let's deal with our sins and temptation that God can open the door. Oftentimes people come and they say, the church is A, B, C, D, E, F. I know like an alphabet, but the question is, at the end of the day, what, where is your heart at? It's true you come here for us to serve you. But at the end of the day, that should be, that should become giving and receiving. Like a relationship. Is it true? You guys complain because I'm always giving to you. You never give me back. Is it true? I'm always doing all these things for you. That's the typical complaints that we hear. But what about Jesus? He loves you so much. Let's. Let it flow with a vision. And what do I mean with this? You have reached a point in your life, you don't know what to do. You cannot do any longer. You try to overcome your sin, it doesn't work. You try to overcome your eating habits, it doesn't work. You try to overcome your anger, it doesn't work. You try to overcome being uncomfortable at church, it doesn't work. And a, a, a long list. Do you know what's, what, what time it is now? Let it flow with a backdrop because God that called you will sustain you. And that's where you need to have faith. Do you know, strong people don't need God. But weak people, God will rise you up. Amen? Amen. So we're going to pray right now. For strength and wisdom. Is there anyone that needs affirmation for their decision to 
that decided to just put Christ, make a change in life. I always ask the young people, do you have a calling? What God has God called you to do? I'm like a pastor when it comes to that. Do you know why? Because I see. Let me just give you a little bit of mystery of Pastor Siegfried. When Mrs. Hedy was here, she had a preschool, and when she had a program, she would say, oh, this is Anna. I think she's going to become a teacher. This is uh, um, Joe. He's going to become a, 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 a doctor. Do you know why? She was speaking life into them. And what I do is, I know sometimes you don't like it, I can see beyond you. I can see beyond you. I can see what you can become if you put your hands in God. We don't need somebody to come from Hollywood. I believe with my whole heart. Here in Amsterdam, forsaken Amsterdam, things can happen when you start seeing yourself because God is still seeking men and women that are willing to go to the cross and bury the cross. If you say, God, here I am, <clears throat> send me, he will never say to you, I don't have no room for you. You're useless. Because the only reason why you can say, God, here I am, use me, it is because God himself instilled the desire in you to do so. Whatsoever desire you have in life about God, trust me, it doesn't come from you. It comes from him. Would you respond to him? Would you respond to the call? Let's all stand. You know what has been said. <clears throat> you know what you heard. I want you to say yes, or better than no, I want you. Why don't you say yes to this? Should I call you up front? Some of you need affirmation. I'll pray for you. If not, you're okay. You want to say, Pastor, I'm going to make up my mind. I'm going to do it. Anyone here? You have to do it quickly, though. One, two, three. No, no. Pastor, I'm going to join you. I want to be just like you. Oh, that's, ah, ooh, that's tough. Mm. You're okay? You're okay? You're okay? Okay, okay. God needs people. God needs people that are willing to commit themselves. You guys don't understand. You don't understand the depth of the wisdom of God. You don't understand what it means to be broken, to be molded, to be needed. For you to be used for His glory. You don't understand. And some of you, it's going to take you a long time. A long time to get it. If you just knew. If you could just understand what it means to partner with God. To take a life that's going to hell. And shame change it. For them to go into the eternity. Oh, if you just knew the love of God. You think you know, you don't know it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We praise you, God. We thank you for today. I ask you to help us in the name of Jesus, God, to put Jesus as, as the backdrop in our lives. And participate in the plan of salvation, God, to preach the gospel. Heavenly Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, because of some of us, we don't have other choice than to preach. And you, are, you have blessed us, oh God, with so many resources, with gifts, talents, and abilities. Help us to see, open the eyes to God open eyes for us to see. Lord, in the name of Jesus, open our eyes, give us wisdom for us to know and understand, Lord. May we be able to see things from generation to generation. May we be able to understand that through us, you won't desire to work a mighty work for your glory. May we fall in love, God Almighty, with your plan to save humankind. 
So we bless you, God. So we praise you. So we thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to go downstairs. You're dismissed. We're going to have fellowship dinner. And you know, the members, you know, we're going to come back by in 45 minutes so we can have, a, have our annual business meeting. All right.